All right, it's time to put together our knowledge from the last couple of lectures and actually use Laplace transforms to apply them to differential equations. Um, it's funny because we've spent so much time developing those formulas up. We've done um, Laplace transforms of all kinds of different functions and combinations of functions and, and such. And then we spent some time going backwards and f seeing how to undo these transforms, going from S land to T land. So it's kind of funny because to actually apply this to differential equations won't take much time at all. This is going to be a pretty short lecture overall, but you'll see why uh, we have a couple of examples to get through and it's not hard to do this. So essentially the idea with applying these um, Laplace transforms to uh, initial value problems is that you can take an equation, an equation like what we have here, um, in this, this next example, y double prime plus y equals zero, <clears throat> we actually have Laplace transforms of derivatives. We have the ability to take the Laplace transform. We can take Laplace transforms of any functions that might appear in the differential equation. And if we go through and we take those uh, Laplace transforms, we change our equation from being in terms of t to being in terms of s. And then if you do some rearranging, you can find an inverse transform to come back and get to a solution. So uh, let's do this, uh, this uh, problem here. So we have y double prime plus y equals zero along with the initial condition of y of zero equals two and y prime of zero equals one. And uh, it says here t greater than zero. I'm gonna say t greater than or equal to zero, I suppose. But this just refers to the fact that once you do all of these operations, as I spoke of in the last lecture, um, when you transform back, you only really get a function restricted from zero onward due to the definition of a Laplace transform, which kind of throws away everything outside of that interval. But let's do this. We're gonna take the Laplace transform of the left side and the Laplace transform of the right side, and we'll see what happens. So I'm gonna get L of Y double prime plus, well, the Laplace transform of Y is, well, the Laplace transform of Y equals the Laplace transform of zero. I can do this term by term because of the linearity of the Laplace transform operator. And then I can apply what I know. We have a formula for L of Y double prime. If you remember, that was the Laplace transform of a derivative of a function. We have a, a form that we can use for that. Taking the Laplace transform, so tr taking the, the transform and applying that formula we get this. We should get a whole bunch of stuff in terms of s. And we're gonna get here s squared L of y. And then remember how to take the Laplace transform of derivatives? We did this. You go down the powers of s while you go up the initial conditions. So s squared L of y minus s y of zero minus y prime at zero. L of y is just L of y. And L of zero, what's the Laplace transform of zero? It's just zero. You can think of this in a few different ways, but the easiest way is probably to think that the Laplace transform of a constant is constant over S. So the Laplace transform of zero is zero over S, which is zero. Okay, here's something that's so interesting. You're given initial conditions in an initial, initial, blah, blah, initial value problem and they pop right out when you take the Laplace transform of a derivative. Y of zero, that's just two. Y prime of zero, that's just one. And I can sub those in and get this. S squared L of Y <clears throat> minus two S minus one uh, plus L of Y equals zero. And what you wanna do at this point, you might think, well, how do you get anywhere from this? But what I'm gonna do is factor out L of Y and bring everything else to the other side. And then maybe you'll see kind of how we go forward here. Factor out L of Y and bring other terms to the other side. So I'm gonna do that. Um, it's not that hard to do. And I think that some of you will already see where this is going to be going. It's kind of cool. I'm going to have L of Y. The only two terms with L of Y are this and this. 
and so I end up with s squared plus 1. If I bring the other terms to the other side, I get 1 plus 2s, and I can isolate for it then. I end up with L of y equals 1 plus 2s over s squared plus 1. I guess I'm going to kind of fish upwards here, sorry, and move up to finish this problem off. But to finish, take the Laplace inverse. The inverse Laplace of both sides. Right? This last line says L of Y equals this stuff. And if you take the inverse Laplace of that, you get Y equals the inverse Laplace of 1 plus 2S over S squared plus 1. By doing that and finding the function of t, you're finding what y is. You're finding what the solution is, and you're done. So here, you're going to get y is l minus 1. Maybe I'll write this in a form like we were talking about for inverse Laplaces in the last video of um, you know, making sure that you write down formulas in the way that you would see them. And I see that 1 over s squared plus 1 is going to be a formula that involves what a sine function, I think. And the second one, if I write it like two times s over s squared plus one, that is going to correspond to some cosine function. And we end up with, uh, let's see here. Yeah, the inverse Laplace of one over s squared plus one is just sine of t, if I remember correctly, my formulas. And the second one will be two times the cosine of t. And guess what you just did? The differential equation is solved. And not only is it solved, but we've already determined the coefficients, right? We've already determined the C1 and C2 using the initial conditions. It's kind of baked into the process because you're subbing them in as you go, and then the result you get to already has them applied. Pretty cool. It's very different than any other techniques we've talked about, but it's highly effective. It's super effective. And um, I'd like you to learn how to use this because it's really useful. And in some fields, uh, they will use this as like the primary method for solving differential equations. So um, it's really valuable. It's pretty powerful. And there's more to, to talk about here. So we're going to do one more example. And this one's a little bit different because it's got a, um, a forcing term on the right hand side. So we'll see how that works. But let's do the same thing as we did last time. I'm going to take the Laplace transform of each piece. So uh, I'm going to skip that first step because I think that's going to be uh, so taking the transform across. Right. If you want to write down L of all the pieces first, go for it. But I'll do that right in this first step. So the Laplace transform of Y prime is S L of Y minus Y at zero. The Laplace transform of four times a function well, I can write that as four times the Laplace of the function. So four L of Y. And then I need to take the Laplace transform of cos of two T here. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, cos is the one with the variable on top, the S on top. So I get S over S squared plus four. And I can apply the initial condition right away and say, oh, Y of zero, that's equal to one. Okay. I'll do the same thing as I did last time. I'm going to factor out the L of Y's. And if I do that, we get L of Y times S plus four. This one can shoot to the other side and I get S over S squared plus four plus one. And I can get to a solution in this way. L of Y equals, and it's going to be S over S squared plus four s plus 4, dividing off this s plus 4 from both sides, plus 1 over s plus 4. Notice that it looks like I have two pieces here, right? I have a piece from my right hand side that turned into the s over s squared plus 4, and now it looks like I'm going to have to do some partial fractions to rip that apart. And then I have this 1 over s plus 4 piece that came from the initial condition and uh, dividing by that s plus 4. And those two pieces actually correspond to the particular and the homogeneous solution. 
which you know that should be there because of the fact that this is a non-homogeneous equation. All of this comes out in the wash really obviously with Laplace transforms. Now, to go backwards, we need to use partial fractions. So, um, use partial fractions um, so that we can do inverse Laplace. Okay, the last term looks like it's totally good to go. It's the first one that we need to, to work on a little bit here. So I'm going to do that off to the side. S over S squared plus 4. S plus 4 is equal to, and it's going to be, A S plus B over S squared plus 4 plus a C over S plus 4, like that. Hopefully partial fractions, not stressful, like, you need to practice them a lot. I, I warned you about that from the beginning, so um, just make sure that you master that now. Um, okay, heavy side cover up gives us C really quickly. So imagine covering up everything but the S plus 4 on the bottom. Or what am I doing? Cover up the S plus 4 on the bottom and sub in minus 4. So I think we get minus 4 over uh, minus 4 squared plus 4, and that should be minus 4. 4 squared like that. That's minus 4 over 16 plus 4 is 20, so I got negative a fifth, I believe. Uh, this is C. C equals that. So I've got C, and then use common denominators or something for the rest of it. So yeah, this is going to equal AS plus B. I didn't leave myself enough room. Let's Try that again. A S plus B S plus 4 plus C times S squared plus 4 over the bottom we know what C is I need to match up the coefficients of um, the numerator to find A and B so coefficients I'm matching them match the coefficients of let's see S squared comes with A, so let's do uh, S squared. I have zero S squareds in the numerator on the left, so I have zero on the left, and on the right, I have A S squared and C S squared, so A plus C. That's gonna force A to be uh, plus one fifth. And if I match the coefficients, trying to look for uh, what B is, uh, that would be B hits a constant, so we can do that. B also hits, um, yeah, I guess that's the easiest way. Let's just do constants. Let's match the constants in the numerator. I guess those are the coefficients of one, but let's see. match constants. So on the top, I am going to have B uh, zero on the left, because there are no constant terms on the, on the left-hand side on the, on the numerator. And on the right, I have 4b plus 4c. Uh, multiplying this all out. So that means that b has to be the opposite of c as well. So I think that b is also going to be 1 fifth. So we have b is 1 fifth, a is 1 fifth, and c is negative 1 fifth. And so I can break that up. So we get that L of Y, I'll write a little bit smaller here so I can fit it all in, but I have A S plus B, that's one fifth S plus one fifth over S squared plus four. I have a second term, C over S plus four, this one right here, and that's going to be a uh, minus or plus negative one fifth, I guess, over S plus four. And then finally, there's the one over s plus four that we started with up here that we shouldn't forget about. So plus one over s plus four right there. So I'm going to rearrange this a little bit so that I can take the inverse transform easily. I also, at the same time, am gonna notice that these two terms can actually come together as one. So, um, but I'll be ready to take the inverse transform after this. So. Uh, I can have S on top or two on top for this first term to get sines or coses. So I wanna have an S on top or two on top. And so I'll put an S on top for the first one. 
That's going to be good for the cosine one. And I'll just have this one fifth outside of it. Okay, the other option is to have a two on top. And so I'm going to split up this fraction and put a two on top, but then I'm going to have to adjust the constant and stuff to make sure that that's right. So two over s squared plus four. But then let's think of what I would have needed here. I had one fifth over s squared plus four. I'm writing a two in, and to make sure that the constant matches from one step to the next, I'm gonna to need to adjust by one over 10. Because one tenth times two gives me the one fifth that I started with. So this looks good. And then that last step, I'm gonna blend these last two terms here. And it looks like I'm gonna have plus four fifths over s plus four. And then I should be able to take the inverse Laplace of all three pieces. And I get one fifth times, it looks like the cosine of two t. It's almost speaking a language, right? I don't have any notes on me. I don't have a table anywhere in my field of vision. I'm going by what I know, what I remember about the formulas. And you should get to the same place. If you need to look at a table and stuff, as you're practicing, cool. Um, I will give you one for the test, but I'm telling you, it's gonna slow you down. It's gonna make you less confident. Know your Laplace transforms and it will help you so much. Um, this is gonna be plus one tenth sine of 2t. And then finally, that last piece is 4 fifths. And then that one just was a simple exponential with a linear thing on the bottom. So e to the minus 4t. And this is the solution. And one thing that's cool is that you can actually go back and do a rough check of your solution against what the problem was. So I have a 1 fifth cos, a 1 tenth sine, and some exponential. Look at the initial equation here. Y prime plus four equals cosine of two T. If you were to just solve the homogeneous equation, have Y prime plus four Y equals zero, you should be pretty comfortable with the idea that that leads to an exponential now. So it's probably not surprising that you should get an exponential with that E to the minus four T there. The cosine that's in the forcing term is gonna force there to be some sine or cosine term as well, or both. And we find that there is both. So you can literally see all three of those pieces make a lot of sense in the solution. But yeah, really powerful technique. Uh, very satisfying to use. Uh, it's easiest when you have an initial value problem because then you can just sub in the different initial conditions, but you can use this uh, without those initial conditions. The only problem is that your solution ends up having to be kind of in terms of initial conditions. So you're, you're instead of having like a a C1 and a C2 that you haven't found, you might end up with like a Y of zero and a Y prime of zero or combinations of them that would generally give you a way of calculating those constants. But then you've got to carry those Y of zero and Y prime of zero without knowing what they are through the whole thing. So it's a little bit of a, a, a trade off there. But if you have an initial value problem, this is a dynamite sort of ability. So highly recommend. Um, learn it well, practice it well. Um, and uh, we're not done with Laplace. So in the, next, uh, in the next section of the notes, we're gonna go through a few different kinds of, of weird functions that Laplace can handle while other techniques cannot. So stay tuned for that. We'll be talking more about those kinds of things and uh, having, I don't know, some, some pretty fun discussions about what, the, what those kinds of functions might physically represent. So join me then um, and ciao for now.